Hi there, this is Mark. In today's DIY video, I'm going to be talking about our rainwater collection system and how we've created enough water pressure to drive sprinkler heads to water the lawn. We live here in the northern outer banks of North Carolina, and so we've got the ocean on our east side and sound water on our west side. So the soil quality here is very sandy. With our Bermuda grass that we have for our lawn, you need to put a lot of water on it to keep it green during the summer because that soil just doesn't hold much water and it just drains right through. Up to this point, we've been using town water and that's been averaging us about $500 a year for watering. So we're looking at alternatives for, uh, for watering. One way you can go is you can put a well in and you don't have to go down that far. You can go down about 15 feet to find water. Unfortunately, that water has a lot of iron in it. So whenever you start to water your lawn and you have overspray, Whatever that overspray touches turns brown and that look really isn't that good uh, around your house. Luckily for us, we have a lot of roof surface area and gutters. And so a rainwater collection system looked to be a great option for us. So in today's video, I'm going to run through all of the, uh, the great details of what we have. But first, let's check out the lawn and go from there. It's a beautiful fall day here in the Outer Banks. I wanted to give you a view of our yard and kind of see, what, show you what we're working with here. So we got some grass on the right-hand side there and some grass on the left. I've planted some rye grass for the winter, which is nice uh, going with the Bermuda grass, Bermuda browns in the wintertime, and then rye grass greens up so you can throw seed down and, and keeps the grass going green for a bit during the wintertime. So there's our left-hand side. And you can get a good a sense of the house here as far as all of our roof area and space that we have available for collecting for collecting rainwater. So lots of good stuff up there and solar panels. I actually have that shown in a different video of how to DIY your own your own panels. And here we are on the side of the house. I consider this kind of the backyard portion of our house. So we'll wrap around here. And for this side, I didn't put any sprinkler heads in. I decided to go with these, uh, these Melnor um, hose heads, which work really well in spreading water around nicely, kind of in this type of pattern. So we'll go with that there, and then around the back of the house. We've got some grass there. So that really runs down what we need to water with our rainwater collection system. I want to give you a brief overview of what we have, and then I'll get into all the nitty gritty details of how it's come together. So again, here's um, kind of a picture of the house. So we've got, uh, again, lots of roof line there and everything connected with gutters. And we have two rainwater kind of collection zones. We have a section here in the front, which has four totes associated with it, with two downspouts, downspouts feeding in. And then when we go to the back of the house, we have seven totes back here. So we've got two right here with one feeder coming in. And then here in the, in the dark zone, in our storage area, we have another five totes back here for collection with one of the totes being filled by the gutter. So let's take a quicker or, or closer look at this right here, kind of an overview. And come around. Okay, so there's our there's our downspout coming down and pops into a first flush system right here with the valve. So when the valve is closed, water comes in, fills up the pipe here with initial runoff from the roof, leaves and debris and things like that get kind of caught in there. Then we come around and down into the tote. And in that area there, I've added a little strainer, actually a little strainer down here, a $1, kind of a dollar store strainer, and then put a paint filter as well around that to collect particulates. And I clean that out once in a while so that uh, keeps the water pretty clean going into the system. 
All right, so that's the quick overview of what we've got. And again, we've got 11 totes. And the way I've scaled the system, and I'll show you um, a little demo of that briefly here. But the way I've scaled it is our system needs about 275 gallons of water a day, about 250 to 275 for watering. So given that, uh, I decided to go with 11 totes, so I basically have 11 days of watering um, from if the totes are full. And to fill all 11 totes, four out front and seven in back, I need about an inch and a half of rain if the totes are completely empty. In order to figure out how much water I'm using for my irrigation system, initially it was connected to the hose bibs in the front and back. And I want to check to see how much water flow I get per minute and then multiply that by the number of minutes that the front zones and the backward zones are running per day. And that gives me a general estimate of how much water I'm actually using, which allows me to size my totes accordingly for my rainwater collection system. So let's go ahead and um, do a little test here. I'm going to have my little stopwatch going on my phone. And we'll get going here. So. Crank it up. I'm just going to wait for this to get filled for one gallon and then see how much time it's taken. The water pressure we have kind of where we are, we're in a cul-de-sac area and we're kind of at the end of the line. So our water pressure at the house isn't great. So there's a gallon right there. So that's about 20, ballpark at around 20 seconds to fill up a gallon of water, so basically three gallons per minute. And I'm running my irrigation system previously before the rainwater collection system, probably about 40 minutes for the front lawn and 40 minutes for the back. So 80 minutes times three gallons per minute is about 240 gallons of water, give or take, you know, plus or minus 10%, something like that. So that allowed me to figure out like, well, a tote, you know, these, these standard totes that you have, which I'll show you in a little bit here, are around 275 gallons completely full, effective use, maybe 260 gallons. So averaging, it's about one tote per day, one full tote per day I would be using. So I decided to go with 11 totes for my system to cover, you know, those dry days during the summer where we just don't get, you know, a rain, you know, rainstorms for, you know, over a week. All right, so let's move on. In order to get pressure, enough pressure to run my sprinkler heads, I have these little RV pumps, which I'll put a link in the description. And they create about three and a half gallons per minute at a, uh, a max pressure of 45 PSI, which is plenty, actually more than my household water was creating before. And so that pump draws the water from the totes and then goes into a standard timer and these are the timers for the backyard and then I have a set of timers similar to this to the front yard and that goes out to the sprinkler system and in this case I'm using an orbit timer. All of the totes are tied together with two inch PVC and so I'm in the back part of the house so these totes are tied together with two inch PVC and you can see the PVC down the bottom there and that runs all the way along the back side of the house here along the kayaks and whatnot to the other five totes that are back here and that all gets connected in. So as the two filler totes, one on the end there and one at the other end get filled up, gravity naturally will do the rest and start filling the other totes up. So let's start at the top and work our way down here. From running the system for a year now, I think one of the key components to simplify your water collection life is to add gutter guards to your gutters. And so the gutter guards clip onto the top of the gutter and prevent any leaves or debris from getting into the gutter system. I found I didn't have those on initially for this front here. I was getting excess leaves and things like that into the system. So if you can put gutter guards on your gutters, it will just save a lot of downstream filtering you need to do for your water and to save a lot of time. And this gives you extra quality water. Now that we have pretty good quality water coming down the downspout, I wanted to create a simplified and aesthetically pleasing first flush system. The theory of the first flush is to collect all of the nasty stuff that comes off the roof right when it starts raining. So, you know, that could be leaves or this, the granular, you know, the granule 
granules from the roof shingles or who knows what that makes its way. Bird poop. It's all up there. So that comes on down. And initially it will fill, the water will come down to this valve and this valve is currently closed. I leave it open for the winter time or when the totes are full or I don't need to collect water that just does a full pass through down into the ground. But when that's closed, the water comes into here. Initially when it starts raining, starts filling up and in theory that's collecting some, some of the nastiness right there and comes up and around and then down into the system. So for most of this, of the PVC that you're seeing here, I was able to purchase it, most of it at Lowe's, except the three inch valves. These were a specialty item, which I purchased at supplyhouse.com. And I think they were probably about 25 bucks each, something like that, 25, 30 bucks each for that. Another few little notes here is, you'll see the T up here. This is a classic uh, uh, waste type of T. And you want to do this shape of, of T such that when the water comes back up, it will just naturally float here and go back in. But when I have the valve open during the winter season or when I don't want to collect water, I don't want water to flow into here. So the angle of this entry point prevents any water from accidentally popping across here and going in. So if you do get teas, and probably a regular tea would work fine, but this is this little extra precautionary measures to prevent water which would, when I just want it to flow down and away from um, and out of the totes, do this type of tea. After a rainstorm, I come out and open the valve here to flush out any of the nasty water that has collected in the first flush system. And then I simply close it again for the next storm. I do question whether I really need the first flush system now that I have gutter guards and a good filtering scheme right at the tote. But since I do want to have the valve there for winterization where I can just open that up and allow water to flow through and not into the totes, it works pretty well. I've seen other type of first flush systems on YouTube where there's separate, there's a downspout coming down and then there's a separate pipe that pops over and down and has more capacity than my first flush system. That, that pipe here really isn't going to hold a lot of water, but I really just haven't had any issues or many issues with extra debris getting into the totes. So you can kind of do your own experimentation, but I feel this kind of inline first flush system, which I think looks nicer than kind of having multiple PVC sections, works quite well. The last tip I'll leave you with the downspout construction here is glue as little as possible such that if you do mess up or you want to switch things around, you can easily take things apart. So I really didn't glue much um, with, with this. The only parts I really glued is from this section here to here, but all these other sections down here, everything's press fit. And so, you know, with this type of system, it's not under pressure. I'm just kind of allowing water to build up. And if a little bit leaks out here and there, it's not the end of the world. So to save yourself some time, if you do make mistakes, not much glue needed when you're doing this type of system, but I do recommend you do a lot of strapping. So a lot of strapping like this to hold in the various um, parts of PVC so it doesn't slide on you. For my front gutter that you see here, I was not able to put a tote right below it from a visual perspective. It just wouldn't, it just wouldn't work. So what I did was to use some basic rain barrel connectors and you can see them right there, the two black ones. And what that does is it collects a good amount of the water coming down. And I have a first flush system here coming down to a valve. So when that valve is closed, the water backs up as the rain starts coming in. And then I have a one inch PVC going along the side of the house. Here we go to this downspout. And again, this downspout wasn't convenient to have a tote right below it. So I'm collecting water off of that downspout with a rain barrel 
four by three rubber connector, which feeds water into that PVC. And then it, they both connect into the PVC here and I jumped up to an inch and a quarter. And then that inch and a quarter comes around and it's nicely pitched. And then that simply drops down into my back downspout here into that T. So I do find I get a good amount of water coming from the front and that front roof surface area, there's a lot of water produced out there. So I didn't want to, I wanted to try to collect as much as possible. So maybe I'm getting 50% of it, 60% of it, but that's pretty good with my, uh, with my volume. Okay, so the, for the filtering right at the tote, so we have our elbow coming in, a little bit of a pitch right into the top of the tote here. And if I just pop this up, again, this is why it's good not to glue anything so you can easily move things around. I have a little filtering mechanism down here, very simple. I'll take it out for you. And actually I do have some leaves in there. And really that's actually not from the, from the downspout. That's from, we're in the fall here. That's kind of leaves just blowing around the yard and in. So really what I do every couple of weeks is come out, tap that out, maybe rinse it out a little bit with some little bit of a uh, little bit of debris and that's fine. And then I can pop that right back in. And again, it's a simple $1 dollar store strainer with a filter for paint just wrapped around it for a little bit more protection. So we can pop that right back in and move on. So just getting back into your, into tote sizing again, as I mentioned before, as I was filling the, the one gallon jug with water, I need about 260, 270 gallons per day to do a nice watering during the summer of the lawn. I'm lucky with my situation here is I can have 11 totes to, uh, to fill up. Your situation might might be different where you just don't have the space to put these totes in, or even if you did, it won't look good on your property. But uh, you really do the best you can. If you can do four totes and, and save some water that way, um, that could work really well for you. So again, um, do some basic sizing on your system to see what's happening. And there's some, uh, there's some tools online as well to given, given your roof surface area, how much water you can create given an inch of rain that's falling and then you can look at your weather patterns and things like that for your sizing of your totes and how many you need. It is very important that the totes do not see any ray of light hitting the water, even indirect sunlight, as you will start to get algae growth. For our four front totes that we have, everything is closed in and, and very neat and so no light gets into those but for these back totes here I covered these with the, some basic uh, vinyl vinyl siding or you know vinyl sheets we got from Lowe's and initially I just put the front one on here and the top because light was naturally just coming in um, really just for an hour during the day and hitting this so I put that in what I found though is for the front I didn't have any type of covering here or for the side and I noticed especially in this front tote here I was getting a fair amount of algae growth along the side of the tote that was exposed to the sun and so you know even indirect sun this doesn't get any uh, direct sun even indirect sun can impact your um, the algae growth so to prevent that you know, wrap your totes kind of like this, or I've seen online on YouTube, a lot of folks taking dark plastic and taking the tote out of the, uh, the container, the steel container, wrapping it and then pop popping it back in. If we go to our back totes here, I got away with not needing to cover the front totes. There's enough, there's enough darkness back here where there's no algae growth back here, but for the these totes that are right near the slats here, they were starting to get some sun later in the day. And I just put up some, some remnants just to protect those. And so that's really solved my algae problem. But it, you know, this any ray of light will create growth in your system. So definitely be conscious of that. There are plenty of places to purchase totes uh, while searching around online. 
Uh, you can get new ones for about 250 bucks, but there are plenty of places that sell used ones that perhaps had some type of food product in them like coconut oil or molasses or things like that. And so those normally go, if there's still some remnants of food in them, for about 125 bucks used. And then if they have cleaned them out, you can get them for about $100 used. I got a tip from a friend here in the Outer Banks that he bought a tote from one of the local rum distillers for $75. And I'm like, ooh, really, what's that? And so he told me where they were, I buzzed them up, and sure enough, they get 275 um, gallons of molasses delivered every week, and then they drain the molasses out for the rum, and then stack them outside, and eventually, the manufacturer or whoever delivers them picks them up, but they don't seem to be too worried about, you know, giving them back. And so they actually sell them and you can get them for, you know, if you're buying a bunch at a time, maybe 50 bucks each, 75 bucks each. It's just a little bonus for them. So I would look around for a distiller to see if they have totes available locally that you can get and, and go that way. But I wouldn't spend more than $100 per tote for these 275 gallon ones. For tote mounting, we have this nice kind concrete pad back here in our storage area. So we were able just to get some concrete blocks and support the totes on the concrete blocks. And I decided to go with two totes. I think that's 18 inches um, high, just to get them a little bit off the ground and allow the gravity feed to work well into the irrigation pump. And for support, I found the way you can see it here is that um, I didn't need to support in the middle here. There's plenty of uh, surface area along the side here just to have four points of contact with the totes. And then to save on some of your cinder blocks, you can rotate the cinder blocks on the, to, on the side here to really support two totes um, on, the same, on the same line. So kind of see what's going on there so actually i'm sorry there's six contact points that i did so you can see those totes in the middle there so three on one side and then three contact points on the other in our front area here this is uh the front two totes on for one of the downspouts right here and i have a little access panel that I can I easily pull off with four screws to get access to the totes if I need to turn off the valves or do any cleaning down here. I just want to give you a sense of how I mounted this. Um, got a two by 10 back there, which is screwed into pilings and the side of the house, so that's pretty sturdy. And then I went with double two by 10s out here, tied into the pilings. And then just in case, right in the middle, I just put another support there to prevent any sagging. Let's talk about all the PVC connections and fittings that we have here. So coming out of the tote, you have the standard tote valve down here. And that comes in out into what they call a buttress two inch connection. Now the key to life is this adapter here. This converts, converts a two inch buttress to two inch, I'm gonna get my acronyms wrong, MPT, MHT. <laughs> I'll correct that, I'll put something up in the comments here. But that standard thread is then compatible with all the kind of general PVC threads that you get out there. So make sure when you get your totes, a lot of them just come with this naturally. Um, but if you don't, you'll have to order that connection on online to go from a two inch buttress thread to a two inch uh, standard thread for BBC. The next little trick I liked, um, uh, I did here was right at that connection point, I put a, um, a screw on union here. So what that allows me to do is this is a quick disconnect. So I can unscrew this and then this whole piece of PVC comes off from the tote. So if I ever need to move the tote or do any type of maintenance or anything like that with it, all of my totes have right at the connection point this, this decoupler, which I can simply unscrew that and it comes off. So nothing that's glued there. The rest of the points along the way, again, two inch PVC and then tons of gluing along the way. And you can see how this one is connected to the next 
tote and then it drops down into the two inch PVC line which stretches the whole span of the back uh, area here to, to connect all, all seven totes together in the back. Coming around the side here. So the two inch PVC comes into this section here and then I then feed it down along here into the little valve. Uh, I'm sorry, a little filter I have here and that goes into the pump, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And overall, when you're doing something like this, always put shutoffs everywhere. So I have a little shutoff here in case I need to do maintenance here. And then at each end of the, the uh, system, I actually have uh, cleanouts. And so I can easily do quick, quick draining here or any type of clean out. So here and all the way at the other end, I have my clean outs. Also when piping your system, make room for expansion. So I added these T-valves along the way with a little screw cap on the top there so that if I ever needed to expand, I could feed into one of those. And that's actually what I did because um, back here, I initially had two totes back here and I added three more and you can see back here how I was able to then to tap into my expansion that I had there and that was ready to go and to connect all three totes in that fashion. So let's talk about tote overflow and clean out. At one, of, at one end of the line of totes, I've added a valved clean out slash drain that will drain the system into the gutter downspout. So you can see that here. So main line comes out around here, it's valved here. And then I've brought that around below the valve for the first flush system, pop that in there. And then if I turn this here, that will drain the entire system out into the downspout. Coming back around to here. So as far as overflow goes, I have this pipe here. So let me pan back a little bit. So what that does is I've set the height of this pipe to be a little bit below the max height of the totes. So as the totes start to fill up, water's going to fill up here on the, on the two inch PVC. And when it gets near the top of the totes, the water will be about right here and then start overflowing down here. And again, that will just, I've just tapped that right into right below the valve there to drain back into the, into the downspout. So for this connection here, a few little tips here, make sure you drill a couple of holes right at the top here. If you don't, you could create some type of siphoning action here, which if water is flowing at a good rate here, it could actually start pulling all the water out of your totes, even when their water drops below the level here. So a few holes up there to prevent siphoning. And again, no need to glue anything back here. This for changing the height or maintenance or whatever you want to do. So no need for gluing. The only thing I needed to glue was the joints down here because this is going to be holding water. I don't want this to leak at all, but once it gets up to the top here, I really don't care. And it doesn't actually leak at all. It's all this press fit into place. And here's my overflow on the other side of the house. So I have actually four of these overflows. I have two on each side of the back of the house, and then I have duplicated that on the front side of the house. One thing I have noticed is during a heavy rain, thunderstorms and things like that, the flow here, the amount of water that can get through here based upon the gravity that's pushing down the water uh, in the totes that curls around here, it can't keep up. And so I will start to get water coming out of the top there during a heavy storm. For that, I really don't care. It's just coming out onto the concrete. It's made to get wet here anyway. But if that is a concern and you want to be able to keep up with the flow and not have anything kind of running out of your totes, I would probably drill a hole in the, in the totes right behind here. In the top side of the tote, maybe a three inch hole and then drain that directly in. And that will certainly keep up with any type of um, high flow coming in from a heavy storm. Since I have more totes in the back of the house than the front of the house, I have seven in back and four in front. 
I water about equally front and back, and so oftentimes my front totes will get get closer to empty than my back totes. So what I did is I connected them together. And so this line here, you can see it go along the back of the house here and then into the ground. This inch and a half PVC actually connects together the front and the back totes. And again, it's all gravity push. So when there's more water in the back totes, that's gonna push water along the line to the front totes. And as it turned out, my front totes are actually about seven inches lower than my back totes. And that actually panned out to be to work quite well, since I always need to push water more to the front totes, I can just oftentimes just leave this open and let them self balance. And then the front totes will have a little bit more, more water than the back totes, but that's fine because there's four totes out front and seven in back here. So that actually works out well. Didn't quite plan for that, but that, <laughs> that was a good mistake. Let's talk about water pressure. So for about four years, I was watering off of the pressure that was coming from the house. And so I scaled my irrigation system here, you know, these items here, little 180, 180 degree sprinklers and things like that around the yard to go off of, to work well with that water pressure that was coming from the house, which really wasn't too great. So, Given that, I needed to either match that water pressure or come in a bit higher than what was coming out with that. And so the way that all worked out is I added a pump, which I'll show you in a moment. With the totes about 10 inches above this hose bib right here, when I turn that hose bib on, you know, I get some water coming out. Not too bad but it's certainly not enough pressure to drive sprinkler heads. That's enough to fill a bucket or something like that. Or maybe if you had a drip line system, enough to drive that, but certainly not enough to, to create enough pressure for sprinkler heads. So what I did is connected that into a, into a pump. And so what happens there, we come out of that fitting into a, I think that was, half inch, I think it went into half inch, yeah, PVC fitting right there. And that filter came with the pump. And what I can do, I can turn this off a little bit right here and I can clean this filter out once in a while. So very simple little thing, clean that filter out and pop that back on and then reopen the valve to the totes. And then decided to go with a little hose connector there, just made it easier kind of connecting through the concrete block there to the to the pump. I'm using a three diaphragm pump that is normally used for RVs to keep the pressure up in a small water tank. I've tried other pumps, but they actually try to pump too much water and then the feed coming in can't feed enough water into the pump. So it starts pushing a lot of air through the line. So I find these three diaphragm, diaphragm pumps that are made to keep that water pressure up in a small water tank in an RV were perfect, where they seem to balance nicely the inflow with the outflow and to keep that pressure up along the way. Uh, for specs, uh, you can either get a 12 volt RV pump, and this one I'm showing you here is a 110 volt pump that pushes three and a half gallons a minute up to 45 PSI. So here, I actually have a 110 volt pump the one out front in the, for the front yard is a 12 volt RV pump. And then I am plugging that into a um, AC to DC transformer to drop it down from house current to 12 volts. The reason why I got that 12 volt one for the front of the house is my initial plan was to have a 12 volt battery that was charged by a solar panel, which would actually run this pump as well as the pump out front. But then we decided, my wife and I decided to get a whole, to go all out and do a full solar array on the roof. So I'm like, well, since we're generating all that power, you know, I don't, I can just plug into a household outlet and we're getting 
tons of solar power for the house. So I didn't feel I need to have a separate battery, small battery system to run my pumps when we have this full new solar array that we have. So, but you can go either way. Uh, if you do want to try that, that could be a nice DIY project to have a car battery or usually a deep cycle battery that can handle multiple charges for a solar panel and then have that run your 12 volt pump. And I did try that initially and it worked well. The 12 volt battery, car battery, pretty much gave the same amount of power as my transformer that's feeding that pump in the front of the house. Uh, the only part of um, about this pump is I would limit the amount of runtime in a row to be about 20 minutes. I do find it gets hot after about 20 minutes of continuous running. So the way I've done my timer is I'll run it uh, maybe for 15 minutes on a zone, let it rest for about 15 minutes, and then heat it up on another zone. And so um, you know, the only thing there, it's probably fine that it can run hot, but I think 20 minutes for these pumps, continuous pumps, uh, is good because they're you know they're, de they're designed to keep that water pressure up in a in a small tank and not really made to run continuously. So uh, keep an eye on that as you use your RV pump. Let me show you how all this is wired up to run the pump and for the irrigation system. So this is a pretty standard orbit timer, and this orbit timer can handle up to six zones. And this is wired down to the six orbit valves down here. And the voltage going in here is 20, 24 volts AC. And that simply turns on and off the valves, the valves accordingly. So that's pretty standard stuff. You know, wiring that in, you've got your common that goes down to there, and then your four, your, in this case, your actually six valves. So now you want to add a pump in. And so most timers have a separate item here for a pump. And what that does is that when any of the any of the six valves come on, it will actually engage 24 volts AC to go over this line. So what I have here is this line comes out out of the box here up and around to the back and in the back here I have a little another another electrical box with a relay. So the common from the timer and the 24 volt from that pump uh, little screw holder comes into here, into the relay. And then this line coming in here is power coming from the house. So that's live 110 volts. When the re relay trips and then sends this power out to these two tabs out here, down to the pump and the pump turns on. So that's the basic flow for that. And these relays here, um, make sure you get a relay and I'll put this in a link in the description. There's tons of them out there. And this one, make sure it's rated at 24 volts uh, AC to trip the relay. And you're all set to go. And uh, the common mistake there is you get a, uh, a relay that is for 24 volts DC. So just remember, the electricity coming out that drives the valves and whatnot from the orbit timer or from pretty much from all these different uh, timers out there are 24 volts AC. All right, so one additional thing I did, which is optional, is as far as the pump goes, when the totes start to run dry, I didn't want the pump to run when there's no water there. Generally, I'm, I'm going to mount around the house, and so I can just come out here and turn off the timer. But for times when not around, or you kind of forget that the totes are going dry, I didn't want to have the pump running, not pushing any water. So what I added is a sensor to turn off the circuit when the water gets low. So let me run through what that is. So if we come back here, We've got this line here is feeding the pump, but then I added this two inch line here, which comes along and all it does is it comes to that elbow and up to this PVC pipe here. And so the water in the totes is gonna go up and down in this PVC pipe and match the level of the totes. What I put in here is I put a set of magnets and the magnets are floating and I glued 
I'll show, show a picture of this. I glued a couple of contact lens cases together to give the magnets enough buoyancy. So in here, there are floating magnets that are basically going up and down. When the magnet drops all the way to the bottom down here, you can see I have this little thing right here. And what that is called, it's a reed switch. And what a reed switch does is when a magnet comes in contact or gets near the reed switch, it will turn on or off. So the way I've wired it is when the magnet comes down here, it actually opens the circuit. So there's actually three wires that come out of here. So you can wire it such that if the magnet is in contact with it, it opens the circuit. Or if the magnet is in contact with it, it closes the circuit. So in my case, I wanted it to open the circuit and prevent the motor from running. So the way I did that is going back up to the timer. Instead of running the the pump line, the 24 volts AC pump, which doesn't you know, carry much current, that's why you can use a reed switch. I redirected that line down to the reed switch and then back up to the relay. So what that means is when the magnet is down at the bottom here and the circuit is open, and then the timer comes on and gives 24 volts to that little um, pin right there, that circuit will be open and hence the relay won't close to engage the pump. So that's my kind of little homemade water level sensor that I used using magnets and a reed switch down here. And I'll put some links in the description of all that fun stuff if you wanted to do that on your own. The one last note here is you could get away with not doing any of the wiring from the pump here because uh, from the little pump uh, connector here from your timer because these pumps run will turn off when they hit a certain amount of pressure. So in theory, you could just plug the pump in and it would turn on for a little bit and try to pump water into the valves, but with all the valves closed, it's going to create back pressure. And when that back pressure hits 45 PSI, the pump turns off. And so generally they would just sit here and when a valve opens, the pump would turn on automatically. I didn't want to go that route in case there was maybe a leak in the system. And, and generally I think you would want to have an expansion tank here to keep pressure up if you're going to go that method, but you could get away with not um, doing that wiring that I, that I had there as far as going off of the, uh, you know, doing the relay and all that stuff. But I think it's a safer bet um, to go that rather than this relying on the pump to decide if there is, you know, an open circuit in the, uh, for the line here for the water, then it would turn on and then turn off when it hits 45 PSI. But just a side note on that. All right, so a few final thoughts with the, my rainwater collection system. Overall cost, probably around $2,000. $750 of that were the 11 totes that I got and then the rest lots of PVC tons of PVC glue and, and some other things uh, timer and, and stuff like that so for me about $2,000 for that and that's offset by I was using about $500 per year for town water so my payback is going to be about four years and I'll be doing well after that after that fourth year. In addition, as far as your needs you might have, is if you do have a well where you can get clean water out of a well, then where what makes sense there as far as the cost? I'm not sure, you know, you know, would you want to go that versus rain, rainwater collection because you're always going to have that water available? That could work well. And so that's really up to your needs and then also the surface area of your roof, whether you can actually collect enough water and also do you have enough space to put all these, you know, a massive 275 gallon totes around, you know, is it going to be eyesore or not? So, uh, but if you have access to a clean water uh, well, that could be a nice alternative to rainwater collection. All right, catch you later.